Um, this is Lucy Sports solo show with us, and it's always a great honour and pleasure. She worked so hard on, on her exhibition, and I personally think this is the best show you've ever done. So well done. I won't say any more because, Pat, it's a great honour that you've kindly opened her show, and you know her work so well, so I'll leave you to it. Well, first of all, I'm delighted to be here, but I refuse to speak unless you've all moved the dial. <laughs> you have, that's great. I can, I can continue. Um, when I was invited to do this, and I heard that the title of the, the show was Scheherazade, um, first of all, I have to confess, who is Scheherazade? Because it, it wasn't part of uh, the makeup of uh, my childhood, so I went off and I researched. I mean, everyone is familiar, perhaps, with the story, but I was not. And I discovered that she was an ancient Persian queen. Um, lucky to be queen, actually, when you know the story. Um, she was the vizier's daughter. And the vizier was a kind of a PJ Mara of today, <laughs> uh, a political advisor. And she was a beautiful girl. She was cultured. She was witty. She had read all the old annals, the folk tales, the legends, the tales of daring do, uh, tales of ancient kings, and, and so on. Uh, well-bred, polite, witty, a sort of a Persian very mocality, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any, uh, anyway, um, she put her eye on the king. Now, there was a difficulty with this, because the king, he had been married before, uh, many, many times before, but his first missus was a bad loss. She was unfaithful to him, and she paid for her crime by losing her head. And he was so broken a man at this point that he decided, from now on, I'll take a wife a day. So he took the most beautiful virgins from all of the kingdom, one by one. He would marry them, spend the night with them, and after the one-night stand, off of the head. Uh, and he did this again and again and again and again. It's sort of a niche, a love-hate figure of the, the Persian era, of antiquity. So anyway, she casts her eye on him, and... Um, the father says, no, 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 you must not. But she insisted, so she married the king. And she had a, 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 an idea. She got her sister to say, will you tell me one last story? And she said, king, before I sleep with you, before uh, I lose my head, can I tell my sister one last story? And the king said, oh, all right. So she started to tell the story. And she kept on telling this riveting tale. And then suddenly she stops halfway through the story and says, that's it. And the king says, what? You cannot stop mid-story. He said, I have to. Dawn is breaking. It's time for me to be killed. He says, oh, no, 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 I've got to hear the end of the story. I'll tell you what, we'll let you live another day if you finish the story. She says, I'll finish it tonight. So that night, she finished the story, but she finished it very quickly, and she started a second one. <laughs> and she got to the, the, the crit critical point in that story, Dawn broke. Sorry, king. I've got to die. And he said, no, no, you've got to finish the story. And she kept on doing this. And she had, in her arsenal of stories, she had a thousand tales. And night after night, she was saved again and again. So after a thousand nights, we're talking about three years now, um, she ran out of stories. Now, the extraordinary thing is, as well, this is according to the legend, she managed in the middle of telling all the stories over the three years to bear the king three children. So it wasn't all storytelling. There were other things going on as well. But at the end, she said to him, I have no more. It's time for me to die. But at that point, he had become a wiser, kinder man. And he said, no, I want you to stay with me forever as my wife. And that's the story of Scheherazade. So it's a brilliant story, absolutely fantastic story. Um, and Scheherazade is the picture behind you. And I don't know what the significance is. I was asking Lucy about the pug, and she never owned a pug, but she babysat a pug at one point. And I, the pug obviously is the king, who behind that very stern demeanor is actually a kind person. The pug is a kind person. So that is Scheherazade. But that is really only where we find uh, the, the, head, the headline theme of tonight's show, because uh, this show, from what I understand it, is, is about the fragments, the remnants of all the things from our childhood, the stories, the bedtime stories that had us saying to our parents or our babysitters, just one more story, please, just one more story, and then I'll go to sleep. And whether they were Grimm's fairy tales, or Hans Christian Andersen, or 
the uh, tales for boys and girls of Nathaniel Hawthorne, uh, the, uh, and, and the book is there, in that, uh, Tanglewood Tales, it's featured in that picture, that's what this is all about. Now, all the stories of our childhood had happy endings, um, unfortunately real life is not quite like that. Um, I just love this show because it, it f for me, is a reminder of the first time that I saw Lucy's work. It was in the Bad Art Gallery in Francis Street, I don't know how many years ago. And seeing one of Lucy's paintings in a corner, it actually illuminated, it lit up that corner of the <coughs> exhibition. And then when I got to know more of Lucy's art, I, I could see this wonderful contradiction that she'd pulled off. She has the most vibrant colors, the most exciting, vivid tones, a, a palette that's extraordinarily strong, and yet many of the themes are serene, uh, sleepy a lot of the time, dreamlike, and calm. And yet you have this fantastic contradiction that enlivens us as, as we look at them. Um, so in terms of uh, the, the, the color palette, it is stronger now. I think there's more paint being used than there was before. The energy that's going into these paintings, you can see it actually on the canvas, but you can also see it leaping out uh, when you view the imagery. Um, in researching for tonight, um, I decided to, to look up what Lucy was saying about her inspiration. And I saw she is getting inspiration from Isnik ceramics. And I said, what in God's name? <laughs> so and where is Isnik? So, uh, does anyone know where Isnik? Well, you do, but probably no one else. Does anyone else know where Isnik is? No. Isnik is, is in Western Anatolia, which is in modern Turkey. It's where Europe and Asia collide. And in the 15th, 16th, and 17th centuries, uh, Iznik was a place where marvellous ceramics were produced. And I must say, I was rewarded in my researches because when I went in to look at these motifs, um, I expected to find things that would be faded and uh, maybe not particularly relevant to today, but they're surprisingly modern. Mm -hmm. And that the kind of things, if they came out of Finland, you'd say, yes, that's the, the Finnish are really at cutting edge today. Oh, but, but it is a mixture of Asian, Chinese, Balkan and European influences. And these things then, we can find them as you peruse the canvases now, you go around and you can find these influences. So I was happy enough, I found out where Iznik was. It's near Bursa, in, and people might, may have been to Bursa in, in Turkey. I was years and years ago. I didn't come across any Iznik art in those days. <laughs> I came across very smelly leather jackets which weren't properly cured and bits of old carpet they tried to flog me, but I never came across Iznik ceramics. And then the other influence, which I think is even more uh, vivid and evident in tonight, is the, the uh, influence of mogul narrative paintings. What are mogul narrative paintings? Well, narrative, obviously, they tell a story, but the mogul art was Indian art. And again, um, the, the pictures, you can, and, and these pictures are very much the same. You look at the picture and you know there is a story to be told. That sometimes the story is not evident. I mean, Tia and Amaretto. Okay, what's going on there? I don't know. You know this is, I, but I, I certainly know that the girl picking bilberries, going through the forest, that's another of the paintings, which is a terrific, terrific picture. Um, I'm thinking, Little Red Riding Hood, she's got a basket. What dangers lurk here in the forest for her? But it's often for us, it is the, 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 the viewer of the picture who has to, if you like, superimpose our own stories, our own fragments of memory, our own uh, childhood uh, resonances. Uh, on the work, but that's what Lucy does to us. She she inspires us to do all of that. I don't know what I've written down here because I'm just speaking from the heart. I think uh, what uh, another of Lucy's skills and great talents is that she can take the everyday, you know, muffins, a tray of muffins, or uh, tulips in a coffee pot uh, as a vase and turn these things into very dramatic pieces. And that's why um, wh when you start looking at a Lucy painting, you see, wow, that's the first thing. And then you start looking at all the little bits. And you, you, you do so much work. You don't have to make them so busy and complicated and layered, but you do. And that is 
of course, part of the reason why I absolutely love your work. I was really thrilled to be asked once again to open an exhibition of yours. And um, I'm here to do that, and I really want to put this show at your disposal for your pleasure and hopefully also for your purchase because she is eminently collectible. The exhibition is well and truly open. As my phone rings. <laughs> Deirdre's there or myself. We're happy to help. Thank you. Thank you very much.